Good evening. 2022 has been a year to remember, but even as the world changes, there are some rays of light in the community. Tonight, we look back on some of the heroic, heartwarming, and even bizarre stories we've shared with you this year. We start tonight with one that will make your heart race. A mother's nightmare when her car is stolen with her two young children inside. But that mom was not about to make it easy for that thief to get away. News 13's Jessica Garate shows us that video. A hair raising 4th of July. And I have two babies in there, a six year old. Vehicle a Hobbs mother's SUV swiped right in front of her with her two young children inside. Okay, which way did it go? She was going that way and she was going all crazy. But she That mom told police she was just about to get back in her car at the Allsup's on Del Paso and Navajo when a woman hopped in the driver's seat. Instantly, the maternal instincts kicked in and she did the only thing she could think of to stop the thief. The mom tried to, she pushed the mom out of the way, mom jumped on the hood. She Nearby surveillance video shows that mother clinging to the hood as the SUV sped through a nearby intersection shortly before the driver shook her loose. I couldn't hold on anymore. I know, well, the way she was driving, you wasn't going to be able to hold on. I'm going to make you hold on that long. Meanwhile, police chased the car all over town. They learn the six-year-old girl has been dropped off on Apache Street, where they find her with a neighbor. But the 11-month-old is still stuck on the wild ride. Is there, hey, is, there, is there another baby in here? No, just think, her? Yeah. Eventually, an officer finds the car abandoned in an alley with the child inside. 10-4, I got the kid. Uh, 46, if you want to bring the mother this way, he's not crying or anything. But. And not far away, the suspect hiding out in a backyard. Officers tackle the woman, later identified as 20-year-old Regina Castillo, and take her into custody. Get in there, hey, give us your hand right now. While mother and baby are at last reunited, a close call that could have come to a far worse end. Jessica got it. They KRQE News 13. Castillo's charges include child abuse, auto theft, and fleeing from police. Her court case is still pending. People who rush in to fight wildfires working to protect the forest and communities sometimes do not have a home of their own to return to. As News 13's Brittany Bade reports, a surprise donation will help house some essential Lincoln National Forest employees. You're definitely getting some preheating on this side. One of the issues that we run into with our seasonal employees is housing. At national forests across the country and right here in New Mexico, dozens of seasonal employees come to town for the summer to do vital work. They include archaeologists, wildlife biologists, and then we have a large seasonal workforce of wildlife firefighters. But Laura Rabone with the Lincoln National Forest says oftentimes the very employees fighting to protect forests and surrounding communities struggle to find homes of their own, especially in smaller tourist based communities like Ruidoso. Some of them do end up camping on the forest. Um, Unfortunately, I know of times that they're living out of their cars. Rabone says the Lincoln National Forest does their best to help seasonal employees find housing. We also try to work with the local communities to find housing for them. And now, thanks to a surprise donation, they will have another option at their disposal. A brand new sustainable property built by Booking.com called the Smoky Bear Ranger District House. And we were incredibly thankful for the generous gift and we're very excited to have it as part of our housing that we'll now be able to offer to our employees. The house comes with large windows, a walk-in shower, and complete kitchen. We want to make sure that our employees are comfortable and safe when they come for the summer. And while this donation will not solve the wildland firefighter housing crisis, Rabone says it will make a difference. It's just going to give them a really nice place to stay after a hard day's work in the forest. Brittany Bade, KRQE News 13. Booking.com says the donation is part of its commitment to sustainable travel, and they thought the birthplace of environmental icon Smokey Bear would be a good place to create their first property. The Rio Grande cutthroat has experienced dwindling numbers in recent decades because of disruptions to its habitat. This summer, monsoon rains swept wildfire ash into the state's waterways. News 13's Dean Staley gives us a look at how those fish made it safely to cleaner waters. A staple in the waterways of northern New Mexico. Rio Grande cutthroat trout are special. Um, they belong here. They've 
always been here. Um, they've evolved on this landscape. That landscape now nearly unrecognizable in the wake of the biggest and most destructive wildfire in New Mexico history since the Hermit's Peak Calf Canyon fire raged through our state fish's habitat this spring and summer. In June, conservationists scrambled to rescue the trout from streams north of Las Vegas. The chief concern, destructive mudslides that can smother stream bottoms where the fish spawn and clog their gills with ash and mud. Fire's not always bad for fish. Um, typically the native fish will, will survive kind of the effects of wildfire a little bit better than non-native fish. It's after the high intensity fire when there's no vegetation right before the monsoon seasons that we need to go in and remove those fish so the mudslides don't kill them. The cutthroat trout are no strangers to being forced from their homes. It took two years after the 2018 416 fire for the fish to return to the waterways of southwestern Colorado. Once we get our forest healthier, we'll be able to not have to move fish so much. For this latest project, crews from the U.S. Forest Service and New Mexico Game and Fish used electro fishing gear to stun as many fish as they could. They scooped them up and trucked them more than 300 miles to Las Cruces. New Mexico State University has a fish holding facility um, and then they'll stay there um, while we either, in this case, we needed to prep a stream for them to be placed into. Now the fish have headed back north. The team strapped buckets of fish to their backs and lugged them to the banks of this creek northeast of Red River. Doing active management like we're doing is a way to make sure that they remain on the landscape and we can keep as many populations as we can. It's rewarding to, to be able to kind of see the project through. Dean Staley, KRQE News 13. Fossils recently uncovered in northern New Mexico may change our understanding of human history. News 13's Brittany Bay tells you what these mammoth fossils reveal and just how old they are. The site turned into an exciting area. A piece of land outside Abiquiu. That just happens to be owned by a paleontologist. So I just laughed and said, I'll be damned. Was once a crucial part of life for people who lived there thousands of years ago. And so it looked like it could be a butcher site right from the start. Back in 2013, one of Dr. Timothy Rowe's neighbors made the discovery. The skeletal remains of a female mammoth and her young calf. And so this was as pristine as it could be. Scientists then started a years-long process of investigating the bones. Scanning some of the bone flakes uh, led us uh, to figure out how the bones were broken. The bones uh, show a, a crust that has the chemistry suggesting they were burned. Leading them to believe the pair was killed by humans. They struck it rich when they managed to, uh, to scavenge or kill the adult mammoth and her calf. But Rose says what makes this discovery monumental is how old these bones are. What I see is a sort of a reconceptualization of um, human history in the Americas. Carpent dating analysis showed the bones are 37,000 years old. And since scientists believe they were killed by humans, that means humans arrived in North America much earlier than previously thought. The convention that uh, you'll see in most textbooks is that humans arrived about 13,000, 14,000, 15,000, 16,000, somewhere in that time span. Rowe never expected his property to turn into the site that now has experts re-examining human history. We need to step back and, and kind of rethink how uh, human actions have uh, shaped the world around us. Brittany Bade, KRQE News 13. In 2019, mammoth footprints were found in White Sands National Park. Scientists believe those were 12,000 years old. A local charter school made the state tournament for the first time this year, despite not having their own court to play on. News 13's Annalisa Pardo shows us. Cottonwood Classical Prep School doesn't have a gym on campus big enough for its boys basketball team. Instead, they go off campus for practice. I know a couple parents were leaving work early, go pick up the kid from school, run him across town. Um, a couple of the seniors drove a couple of the, you know, the junior, the upperclassmen were driving each other up back and forth. 
Um, sometimes us coaches would go fly to the school, pick up the kids, get them to practice. Then once game day comes, they hit the road, playing their home games on their opponent's court. So it makes it hard because, you know, the home court is usually a big factor for you. Because you know where your favorite shot is at, where you can shoot from, how you do everything. And we don't even get a practice in those facilities before games. Despite the challenges, the Coyotes had their eyes on the prize, making this year's state basketball tournament. And when we saw our names come across the board, man, we were we were excited. We were excited. We were jumping with joy. The Coyotes had to play district rival Sandia Prep in the first round. And even though they lost, they say the season still feels like a win. The boys were, I mean, excited and made history. I kept telling them as long as we just got to make, we made, we, make, we made school history. You guys got in. You guys got that experience. Now we got to build on that and just keep working and keep grinding and doing our thing. Annalise Sapardo, KRQE News 13. Maestha says the school is currently in the process of building a gym on campus. If you're wearing athletic shoes right now, you have a New Mexican to thank for helping design them. From Nikes to Brooks, News 13's Jessica Garate shows you how Stan Hawkerson revolutionized shoes. This is the very first Nike shoe that was nylon. Uh, underneath, is, that's the very first running shoe from New Balance in 1964, maybe. You would be hard-pressed to find anyone who knows more about athletic shoes than Stan Hawkerson. Um, I came out of Cal Poly, a kinesiologist. This runner's shoe story starts in 1976. And the shoes didn't seem to be very good back then, and I was training for the Olympic trials and the marathon, so I was blowing through them quite fast, and I didn't have the money. So I started to f cut up old ones and fix them up. Back then, shoes used to sit on top of the midsole. That's how shoes were in 1975. And Hawkerson tried dropping the shoes inside the midsole to add more control. This shoe just sits on top of this foam that was die cut out. And then we started to inject the midsoles, and that's what they look like. So now the shoe sits inside that has a wrap around the heel that can keep it from going you know, supination to pronation. His dad knew he was on to something big, taking him to a patent attorney. So that is the original patent that I did. He invented the first cross trainer shoe. You can't even buy a shoe without that patent on it. But it took 10 years to convince the big companies. And then finally, Nike was making the Air Max, which incorporated it, so we licensed it to Nike. And then there were legal battles. So everybody else copied Nike, and now I had to be a lawyer and go after all of them for infringement. But now his design can be found in just about every athletic shoe made. There's not an NBA player that doesn't play in this. Hawkerson opened Heart and Soul Shoe Store in Albuquerque in 2000. And then this is Mark Plachis that I built, uh, and he won the world championships in that shoe. A store that's also full of history. There's only five or six disruptive patents. And Hawkerson is looking to disrupt the shoe industry again with a new patent. We can tune both feet so they're perfectly neutral. And then my partner Brad Carvey has put a sensor in these wedges that eventually will tell you, email your phone and tell you when it's starting to fail. And we're going to Nike or Adidas with that one. Jessica got it. They KRQE News 13. On Super Bowl weekend, a Rams super fan here in Albuquerque showed off just how much he loves them, including an impressive display for the Los Angeles team. News 13's Annalisa Pardo shows us. Roger Romero starts every game day by hanging this Rams flag outside his west side Albuquerque home. I always say I don't like the Rams, I love the Rams. He's been a fan since he can remember. Just the team, the you know, the helmet, mm -hmm. you know, just the... Ram, you know, just the <laughs> Ram, you know, so I love him. So much so that what started as having this one Ram's clothes pin turned into, well, this. It's the Ram room. We watch every game in here. Romero records the games too. And if they win five in a row, I keep them. When they lose, I get mad and I delete them. <laughs> <laughs> one side dedicated to the team's time in Los Angeles, the other, I created this side of my room for just all St. Louis. From signed and custom made jerseys. Lawrence Phillips signed the sleeve. To cards, to his favorite rings. 
I call that their first Super Bowl ring. Nearly every inch of the room has a perfect piece of Rams memorabilia put in place. Because I just wanted to show my team support. You know, I love them. So needless to say, Romero was pretty excited when the team earned their spot in Sunday's big game. <laughs> I jumped and I can't jump high, but I got, we're in the Super Bowl. You should have seen me jumping so happy. And while maybe a little nerve wracking. Oh, yes, I haven't slept or you should see. It's like if I'm playing, but I don't play. Win or lose, Romero is always on his team's side. In New Mexico, I love you guys. Some people are going to jump on the bandwagon, you know, of course, but they have a true ramp man in here. Annalise Sapardo, KRQE News 13. Of course, Romero watched the Super Bowl in the Rams room with his wife and grandkids, and we can only imagine his excitement when they defeated the Bengals 23 to 20. A love story filled with perseverance and a little luck. An Albuquerque family celebrated a big birthday this year for the smallest baby Presbyterian has ever taken care of. News 13's Brittany Bade shows you. Jari was born on February 22nd, um, and my due date was... Yeah, June 13. At just 24 weeks gestation, Jari came into the world weighing 11 and a half ounces. I remember them taking me right after my C-section to go see him, and I, I couldn't even see him in there because he was so small. I couldn't even lean over and like see him because all the stuff around him was bigger than him. Mom Amber and baby Jari's first meeting was far from a private affair. A swarm of Presbyterian NICU nurses and doctors were crowded around the family, ready to start immediate care to help Jari breathe. Those breathing tubes only come so small, um, and that was our immediate concern was whether it was going to be small enough to actually fit in his little airway. Dr. Jennifer Anderson says luckily the breathing tube fit, but Jari's tiny stature still only gave him a 30% chance of survival. And I remember coming over to Amber afterwards and saying, well, we're going to make a go of it. The breathing tube fit, and um, we're going to see. It's going to be a long and bumpy road, I think. Slowly but surely, the tiny hand that could not even wrap around the tip of his mom's finger grew and grew. I didn't get to hold him till he was almost a month old. Um, so of course it was really hard, but it was comforting just to when we'd go in and we'd sit with him and read with him. Over the course of 127 days, Jari grew from 11 and a half ounces to a little more than five pounds and was finally cleared to go home. It's kind of amazing that we're able to get babies from less than a pound and grow them up and uh, send them home with their families. It's the most rewarding job I can imagine. The family still meets up with some of Jari's NICU nurses who love watching him grow. I was just so thankful for all of the staff because it was such a a touch and go situation for the first few months. Um, we were just taking it day by day. And now they are just days away from his big first birthday. So we were really scared. So it means a lot that he's healthy now and he's about to be one. Brittany Bade, KRQE News 13. Another big celebration also took place this year. Back in September, family, friends, and even local law enforcement came to celebrate Odine Dale's special day her 101st birthday. News 13's Carla Sosa has more from those festivities. Two, three. There was a huge celebration at Beehive Home Senior Living in Rio Rancho. Happy birthday to you. And it was all for Odine Dale, who's celebrating turning 101 years old. This has been really a delight, a pleasure. Uh, eye-opener, a love fest. She was serenaded by an Elvis impersonator. Rio Rancho Police and Fire Department also stopped by to congratulate Odine. She was born in Searcy, a small town in Arkansas. At the age of 15, she met the love of her life. The couple lived in Southern California and Arizona. Last February, she moved to the senior living. So what's Odin's secret to living 101? Just don't stop breathing. <laughs> you can't you can't be here if you're not breathing. <laughs> I have no secret. This is just a gift given to me. 
Thomas Dale says he's glad his mom reached this milestone, especially after being a cancer survivor. She had breast cancer and colon cancer, and I think she had it twice and she had kidney cancer. She had a kidney taken out in 1967, so she's been living on one kidney ever since. He wasn't able to see his mom during COVID, and celebrating this milestone means a lot to him and his wife. Well, it's amazing to me. I, did, I didn't know that there were this many people who even knew her here, you know. Odin is already looking forward to celebrating her next birthday. Carla Sosa, KRQE, News 13. Welcome back. A hiker missing in the Sandia foothills last month is sharing her story to warn others about the dangers on the trail. News 13's Alexis Kineski has her story. And I followed that goat path and I followed it up, 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 up to the top. Lorna Greenway is retracing her steps after she spent nearly 16 hours lost in Albuquerque's foothills last week. There's a picnic shelter because I went straight down this path to it. Lorna moved to Albuquerque six weeks ago. She's been living the dream, exploring a new trail every day, something she's loved doing for 40 years. It's new territory. Um, it's a new challenge. But last Tuesday was a hike she'll never forget. She started at the bottom of the Indian School Trailhead around noon, but didn't get off the hill till 4.30 the next morning with some help. During her hike, she got very lost. As the sun started to set, she called her husband with the last bit of phone battery asking for help. I waited and I waited and I started to get really, really cold. Eventually, she saw a drone flying in the darkness and shortly after that, the Albuquerque Mountain Rescue Team. I kept calling and kept calling and eventually they got close enough to say, Lorna, is that you? And I said, yes. After hours, the rescue squad was able to get her down safely. Were you scared? No, nah, I couldn't be. Today, she says words can't describe how grateful she is for the volunteers of Albuquerque Mountain Rescue, who helped get her to safety before hypothermia kicked in. Yeah, I'm extremely thankful for, for those guys. Lorna says this isn't going to stop her from tackling the foothills again, but next time she'll do it differently and be more prepared. I've heard stories about other people being rescued. You know, I thought, eh, never happened to me because I'm, I'm too careful. And uh, it happened. Alexis Kineski, KRQE News 13. Albuquerque Mountain Rescue wants to remind hikers to be extra careful, especially this time of year when temperatures can drop in an instant. Lorna has posted about her experience on Facebook and is asking people to donate to the rescue group that saved her. You can find the link on our website, krqe.com. A Nebraska man spent years trying to track down a family treasure. Back in March, he finally found it in a New Mexico garage where it's been the last four decades. It may just look like some old car, a little rusty and very dusty. Yeah, that was a long, long time ago. But for Mark Yardley, this Camaro is much more than a car in need of TLC. Memories of letting in the antenna hole on the fender. In fact, the old convertible has sentimental value. You see, it used to belong to his dad. Back in the day, my father was quite a drag racer when I was a kid. And I helped him work and build on the cars. His dad retired from drag racing in 1977. There was no longer any reason to keep the car. And so this car left and my mother took a picture of it rolling out of our driveway in 1977 on this exact weekend, 45 years ago. Yardley's parents both died in 2006. We lost my mom in 06 and unfortunately four months after that I lost my father too. Since then he spent a lot of time thinking about the memories made. Memories of filling the holes for the under insignias. And the lessons learned in his dad's garage. I didn't appreciate back in the day how talented and how good my father was. He made it his mission to track it down. Finally, a few months ago, after years of searching, he found it in Bosque Farms. You no, know, I was afraid of this, and I'm a pretty tough dude. 
And with tears in his eyes, he and his wife were able to pick it up today, making the drive all the way from Nebraska. Will it remain a race car or will it become a street car? That one remains to be seen. But you know, that really doesn't matter. What matters is it'll be in my garage. And every time I walk out there and open the door, I'll pick up my dad. He says he knows one thing is certain. It'll never be sold again. Back in September, some rescued beagles got a new home in New Mexico. They are among the thousands rescued by the Beagle Freedom Project from testing facilities around the country. News 13's Natalie Wattis has more. Lynn Hopkins came to the Santa Fe Animal Shelter and Humane Society for a very special purpose. I came to get a beagle, one of the lab beagles. After hearing about the rescue of around 4,000 beagles from a testing facility in Virginia, Lynn knew what she had to do. One night I was watching the 10 o'clock news. There was a story and I thought, I want one of those. Today, Beagle Freedom Project rolled into Santa Fe with some animals not from Virginia, but from another facility. This is a laboratory in Oklahoma that tests flea and tick medication on dogs. Um, so they have lived their entire lives in a laboratory setting. We don't want them to be put down just because they've been part of animal testing. We want them to now live their life as a dog. These pups traveled across state lines, hundreds of miles to find their forever homes in Santa Fe. And today, four of them found just that. Beagle Freedom Project took in 34 dogs and seven cats from this facility. Four are being rescued in Santa Fe, five are headed to Flagstaff, and the rest are on their way to Los Angeles. This is my little buddy. <laughs> so we're going to take him home. It's everything we can wish for, right? You know, like all we want is for them to live their best dog life. Natalie Wattis, KRQE News 13. The Beagle Freedom Project has rescued animals from facilities in 36 states and eight countries. The nonprofit says they have rescued everything from rats to horses. It is a rare honor for the University of New Mexico and for the man who led UNM's geology department for more than three decades. His name on a map of the heavens forever. News 13's Dean Staley shows us. From now on, when someone looks at a map of the planet Mars, they will see a massive crater that would span from Grants to Albuquerque, named for the longtime head of UNM's geology department, Wolfgang Elston. Well, it makes me feel really wonderful. Horton Newsom is a research scientist with UNM's Institute of Meteoritics. His team, with Elston's help, worked to identify and map places on Mars for the Curiosity rover to land in 2012. It's really gratifying that, that uh, we were able to get, he was able to be recognized in this fashion. It's quite an honor to, to have your name on another planet forever. Elston died in 2016 with his work mapping Mars just a small part of his legacy. Because of his, his dedication to New Mexico geology for his amazingly long career, generations and generations of students were trained at University of New Mexico by Wolf. And so this is a, a tremendous legacy of his. Those students include Larry Crumpler, a grad student of Elston's in the 70s. He was a kind of a down-to-earth sort of person who actually knew what it you took to actually be a scientist. Crumpler is on the staff of the Museum of Natural History. He is also on the team using the Perseverance rover right now to map Mars and collect rock samples. Last time I saw Wolf, I actually thanked him because he actually made me into a field geologist, which I'm now using to own two different planets because I still do it here on the Earth in New Mexico, but I, I'm doing it daily on Mars now. Crumpler's book, Missions to Mars, is just out. It is the first time the Elston Crater has appeared on a map in this form. It's big, 50 miles, yeah. 50 miles across. Yeah. That's Crumpler sharing the image yeah. with Elston's son, Steve. Steve Elston earned a physics degree at UNM, got his Ph.D. at Princeton, and now teaches at Harvard. Well, I was just thrilled because he had spent you know, decades studying craters and working on lunar and planetary geology, and I knew he'd be thrilled and it was a great, you know, just such a great honor. All this from a man who, as a Jewish boy in his native Germany, fled Germany ahead of the Nazis, survived the Blitz in England at a school for refugees, 
and was reunited with his parents in the U.S. seven years later. To me, what was more remarkable about my father was he had gone through all that, you know, being run out of his country and, and barely escaping and then being bombed and, you know, everything. And yet he had this very, he was always optimistic. He was always ready to tell a joke. He was always ready to start the next big thing. And, and it, you know, it never seemed to have dampened his spirits at all. Just part of a remarkable legacy on this earth and beyond. Dean Staley, KRQE News 13. Scientists at UNM are working on multiple Mars missions. They have collaborations with the Museum of Natural History, Los Alamos National Lab, and NASA. With New Mexico seeing a boom in the film and television industry, one organization is training the next generation of filmmakers. News 13's Marilyn Upchurch spoke with the group holding a popular competition for New Mexico's youth. I'm super excited for this year because last year was so fun. Just the opportunities that came with it was amazing. Megan James is a senior at Maya Mira High School in Gallup. She's also a film director. Last year, she was one of the winners at the Film Prize Junior Film Festival. And it's so exciting to be supporting this next generation of young storytellers here in New Mexico. Film Prize is a Louisiana-based organization who encourages filmmakers to create short films. As New Mexico's film and TV industry grows, organizers decided to target the state's youth. I think that we've just found this treasure trove of stories that are being told by these kids about their state. And watching these kids be as prideful as they are about New Mexico is something that is, is really what Film Price Junior has always been about. The organization provides middle and high school students support and access to mentors. While it's open to all students, they're trying to get more Native American students interested in the industry. It's just so important, you know what I mean? Just to have those stories being told and that representation. Winners receive up to $2,500 in grant money to buy cameras and other equipment for their schools. We uh, are very committed to providing access to opportunities for careers here in New Mexico. Once students sign up and shoot their prompt, their film hits the big screen. Last year, the film festival had more than 500 students from around the state competing. They expect to have even more participants this year. And it's such an amazing, bright group of kids and teachers that are really creating some of the best content we've ever seen in Film Press Junior. Marilyn Upchurch, KRQE News 13. More than 50 schools signed up for the competition. The festival will be held in Albuquerque in April. For many, the start of isotope season means baseball and time at the ballpark. But for one Arizona couple, it means coming back to family. News 13's Annalisa Pardo introduces us. When baseball is back... It's back to work for wife and husband of nearly 40 years, Mickey and Len Roberts. Hi there, welcome back. Yeah. Yeah. The two travel from Arizona to Albuquerque to work at Isotopes Park for the season. We were basically winding down, retiring, if you will, <laughs> and uh, needed to be doing something to get out of the house. This is their 14th year. Mickey monitoring the El Jimador party deck. You know where you're headed? No, I don't. And Len ushering fans in section 106. Hi, what'd you get? Hi, Dr. No. It's, it's a wonderful experience. For Mickey, it's a homecoming. Albuquerque is my hometown. This is where I grew up. But it's the people they've met that keeps them coming back. Oh, Jerry, it looks like you're going to eat well tonight. The people we work with, the fans also. You get to know those folks. You get to know about their families. You see their children grow up. With some fans from their first season. And he knew where everything was. <laughs> and we became the best of friends. Turning into family. He's my best friend in Albuquerque. And she's my best yeah. friend in Albuquerque. They come to visit us in Arizona. The Roberts have no plans to stop making the annual trip to New Mexico. I feel like I've come home. Um, we miss the Mexican food, of course, because there's nothing like New Mexico food. You can't find it anywhere else. We've tried. <laughs> it doesn't exist. To be part of this team. We love it. 
So we'll keep coming back. Annalisa Sapardo, KRQE News 13. He's a high school football player who continues to score in life just by being on the field. Our Jared Chester explains. When I was born, the chances of me living to this age weren't that high. And so it's a very special moment to me and like just everything I do, my family, my doctors, everybody. Just a great, great like experience. Happy to be alive. Diagnosed with cystic fibrosis, which is a genetic disease that causes the body to make thick, sticky mucus in areas like the lungs and digestive system. Life hasn't been the easiest at times for 17-year-old Justin Lucero, but football has always been something that keeps him going. Yep, we even did a story on Lucero when he was 10 years old and how his foundation, Justin's A-Team, helped raise awareness and funds for cystic fibrosis through flag football. Everybody is actually raising money for me and I think that is just amazing. Yes, there is still the Justin A team on Facebook and that is my group. That's that's everybody I love. They help support me. They really like changed my life. Over the years, Justin's A team along with Primetime Athletics have raised a lot of money towards cystic fibrosis and it has meant a lot to Justin who in 2019 started to take a life-changing drug. With the new treatment, it like really changed everything because I feel great with it and it's just amazing how far the research has came. Justin has had plenty of opportunities to give up, but that's not who he is. And his football coach at Valley High School says he doesn't even let his teammates know of his disorder and just leads with hard work and dedication. He tries to be as normal as possible and he's a great kid and he doesn't let whatever he has get him down. Justin is one of the greatest kids we have on the team. And I think when the kids see this story, they're gonna be like, okay, okay, well, I see I see why he's like he is. From 10 years old to now, football and cystic fibrosis awareness has been Lucero's journey. And that continues into life past high school as he hopes to study sports medicine to remain close to the football field. And of course, he looks to give back. Gotta give all my glory to God because it just really blessed me to be alive till now. and just let me experience life to this to this age and I want to become successful so I can make sure that I could bring even more awareness to cystic fibrosis. Reporting Jared Chester News 13 Sports. Roswell High's dance team has a long history of champions. Their latest run at state earlier this year brought home their 14th win. Madison Connor introduces you to the woman behind it all. And now performing the Roswell Charlie. I danced when I was a little girl. For nearly 23 years now, Kim Castro has been at the helm of the Charlie's Angels dance team in Roswell. I'm from Roswell. Okay. I, I uh, actually went to school at Roswell High School, graduated in, in 1984. Back then, Roswell didn't have a dance team, so she changed that. It was kind of something my oldest daughter, she's 37 years old, but it was something that she really, really wanted. So um, I started the dance team. And Her daughter has long since graduated but something keeps Castro coming back year after year. So it was just something that I wanted to bring to Roswell High and um, never did I anticipate that it would become as successful as it is. But With Castro leading the team, they've won more than a dozen titles. Their most recent win, just a few weeks ago, marks number 14. We've won 14 state titles and three national titles. Through hard work and dedication. Our kids are very dedicated when they come to our program. They kind of know what is expected of them. And the years of success makes for a strong foundation for new additions. It's a program that people want to be a part of, and they'll they'll go the extra mile to, to um, contribute their part to the program. Always setting goals for herself and the team. You know, I told the girls the first year, if we could even place in the top three, that would be an incredible uh, an incredible accomplishment. And they did, placing third at state. From there, the sky was the limit. Okay. okay, now we know we can get first. Once we got first, it was kind of a scary place to be because, you know, where do you go from there? But they've grown and adapted with the sport to try to stay on top. And her time as head coach is far from over. I think I'll know when I'm ready to to be done, but I don't feel it right now, which is pretty neat. Madison Connor, KRQE News 13. 
Castro only had one student graduate in May, so she said she was looking forward to getting the team back together for another year of competition. Albuquerque veteran who is known for going above and beyond with his Christmas lights got an unexpected Christmas gift of his own from his neighbors last month. News 13's Annalisa Pardo was there during the surprise for the man many call Mr. Christmas. They call him Mr. Christmas. He's a legend. I mean, there's everyone knows who he is. Davis Pillard has been putting on this impressive light display in Ventana Ranch for nearly two decades. To give to the people. But bringing the holiday cheer isn't as easy as it once was for the 83-year-old veteran. I was going to quit two years ago because my health I can't climb like I used to. That's when neighbors like Nate Bywater stepped in. And I said, well, then, then myself and the neighbors are going to take over and, and we're going to decorate for you. Soon learning the toll 20 years of Christmas cheer can take on the home. We had noticed uh, over the last two years of decorating up there that um, the, the roof was in quite disrepair. So we started the GoFundMe and um, I mean, the, the GoFundMe itself I mean, it, it spoke for itself and just kind of blew up overnight. Into a surprise Davis couldn't believe. And you never take help. You never want the donations. You never take cash. So we thought, what can we do to help and or, or not to help, but rather to say thank you for everything you've done. Two decades of providing smiles for our children, our families, the community. We started a little bit of a campaign online for the community to say thank you to you. As of this morning, there's over $6,000 for you. So we're going to we're going to be giving that to you. We're going to sign over that account to you today. And it's growing quickly. Oh god. And that's not all. A local roofing company heard what was going on. On behalf of uh, NM Premier Roofing, we'd like to warranty your roof. We're going to handle all of the existing damage that you have and any future damages that you have. We want to be able to help you out and not have one less thing for you to worry about. Ah, good thing I have my class. <laughs> oh my God, thank you ever so much. Now the money can help Davis and his wife with their medical bills. <sighs> you can see. It means so much. Like I say, there's going to be a special day I'll never, ever forget. Annalisa Pardo, KRQE. Oh, my goodness sakes. Wow. What a surprise. <sighs> News 13. We hope you enjoyed just some of the many good stories of 2022, and we hope there are many more to come in 2023. Thanks for watching and have a happy New Year.